We want to do the final part of our message called Decrease for Increase. And this morning I want to talk about vision in relation to your calling. So the kingdom needs to keep advancing. And for it to keep advancing, you and I need to follow Christ and pursue our calling. Look at the person next to you, say, you are called. Okay, that wasn't really good. Say, look at them again, say, you are called. Every believer this morning has a calling on their lives. Now, when you know your calling, then listen carefully. Your vision isn't just a vision, it's an inspired vision. Because how you know, even the world understands vision is important. Even the world sets goals for themselves. And 90% of it they got from the Bible. But you can have a vision, but how you know, for your vision to be inspired, it needs to come from God. It needs to be something that God has deposited there. And here's the reality. When our calling creates an inspired vision, this is what happens. It becomes contagious in a good way. People catch it and it will influence their lives for increase. The church is the first and oldest corporation in the world. Jesus is the greatest leader that ever walked the earth. Hang on, we can't even say that ever lived because he's still living. And so we should know something about vision as a church. And it's really important. You know, David McAllister Wilson, in a recent book on leadership, said this, vision isn't everything, but it is the beginning of everything. Proverbs 29 verse 18 carries this out. In the NLT translation, it says this, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. Whoever obeys the word, whoever follows the word, whoever follows the divine guidance that God gives them, their lives will be joyful and filled with happiness. Pastor Ray says it like this, Godly vision and passion for the things of God will make a massive impact on other people and it will also produce commitment in our lives. What are you committed to this morning? In the GNT translation of Proverbs 29, 18, it says this. Listen to this awesome scripture in the GNT. It says this, a nation without God's guidance is a nation without order. I mean, that explains a lot. Happy are those who keep God's law. So we could say this this morning, vision is powerful. Art Borsov made this statement last week in his, in his sermon. He said, nothing will change in our lives without a vision from God. So could you look at the person on the other side and say, have you got a vision? Now, can I reiterate and clarify this? It's not just having any vision. It's having the right vision. How many of you know you've got to have 2020 vision? <laughs> Don't live in 2019, it's gone. You've got to have the right vision. And when I say the right vision, I'm talking about an inspired vision. And that's where our calling comes into focus. Because you see, our calling directs and inspires the vision that we have. When you know what you're called to, your life gets purpose. And when your life gets purpose, your vision is ignited. And so... What we need to realize is that when our calling comes into focus, our vision gets synchronized and connected with our Father and with His plan. Many years there was a book and the the guy said this about vision. He says, be careful you don't get to the end of your life and you climb the steps of your goals and you climb the ladder of your vision and you get to the top of the building and you realize it was leaning against the wrong building. So let's make sure the the vision, the ladder of our lives is against the right building. It needs to connect and synchronize with God's plan for our lives and listen, for the church. Because how do you know God is building his church? We are part of his church. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 brings this out so powerfully. It says, but you are a chosen generation. Remember I said just now, tell the person next to you, you have a calling. 
Look at this verse. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you would proclaim the praises of him. Look at the next statement. Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? So touch the person next to you again. Say, see, you're called. So vision this morning, remember this, vision is always about people and making a difference in this world because God loves people. How many of your lives have changed positively because of the kingdom and the vision of God in your life? How many of your lives have changed because of Jesus? Amen. My life is so different. Your life is so different because of what Jesus has done in our lives. So It's always about people, but listen carefully. It's ultimately about God's kingdom. So what are we saying? Everything we pursue must somehow connect into heaven's culture. Let me give you an example. You might be bringing up a child, and so your vision is to grow that child and develop that child's gifts and and make that child the best child they can be. How do you know? That's having vision. But how do you know? The reason you're doing that is to connect them with God's call for their lives so they can become everything God purposed them to become. Because the child you're bringing up this morning might just be the one that has the cure for AIDS. The child you've been bringing up might be the one that's got the cure for the coronavirus. I hope he's old enough to let us have it soon. (laughs) So so when I say calling, I'm not just talking about is he going to be a preacher. All of us are preachers. Just the vehicle we use is different. And so we need to understand, yes, it's about people. Yes, it's about making a difference. But it's ultimately ultimately about the kingdom of God. Because listen carefully this morning. If you are just helping people, and making a difference, but you never present the gospel to them, you are just caught up in humanism. It's the gospel that connects us with heaven's culture. Can you say amen? And ultimately, yes, we want to help people. Yes, we want to make a difference in this world. But the only way we can do that is connecting people with Jesus. Because he is the life changer. He is the life giver. He is the power of God. He is the only way to the Father. And he is the one that will revolutionize your life. Can you say amen? So, what I want to talk about this morning is not so much vision, like just a good teaching about vision, and there's nothing wrong with it. I want to talk about how does this vision emerge out of our lives? How do we get a hold of it? How do we connect with it? How do we synchronize with it? And then what do we do with it? So number one, there are five things this morning. We're going to race through them, and and then we're going to trust God just to impart something into our spirits. Number one, vision emerges from God's presence. Vision emerges from God's presence. Isaiah 6 verse 8, it says this, speaking of Isaiah, he says, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So Isaiah had just had an incredible encounter. He had had a spiritual vision. He had a spiritual uh, experience where he actually came in contact with Jesus, the son of the living God. Go read it in the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter six. He comes to this incredible, incredible moment He's in God's presence. He's experiencing God's presence. Listen, and he hears God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit having a conversation. And this is what they say. Whom shall we send and who will go for us? How many would agree with me that Isaiah was definitely called by God? I mean, go read the book of Isaiah. It is full of biblical prophecies. That are still coming to pass. How many of you agree Isaiah was called by God? No, he wasn't. I know I kind of set you up there. But that's because I've got the notes. I discovered, listen, Isaiah wasn't called. Well, okay. He wasn't called by God. Have a look what happened. Have a look at the rest of verse 8 quickly. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, who's that talking about? 
Isaiah. Then Isaiah said, here I am, send me. So God never called him. He responded to the call of God. He was in God's presence. He heard God having a conversation with Jesus and the Holy Spirit saying, who's going to go? And I said, here I am. And God said, fine, go. So yes, he was called, but how you know, he accepted the call rather than God say, Isaiah, I want to send you. We could say it like this. He was in the right place at the right time. Where was that? In God's presence. So vision in our lives emerges from being in God's presence. From hearing what it is that God is saying to us. And God speaks in many different ways. And we're going to see how this unfolds out in our lives. Because you see, the reality is this. God wants you to know this morning that He has favored you. Many things are calling us today. But what are we going to respond to? What are we going to say, here I am, Lord, send me? How are we going to connect with that thing? Some of these calls today will be answered, but many won't be. And so what it's saying to us this morning, we need to recognize the call of God, and we need to consistently come into his presence so that he can impact that in our lives. Can you say amen? That's why a daily quiet time is the most incredibly powerful thing that any person can do once they're saved. God providentially weaves his call into our lives, and you are the only one that can distinguish it. People can confirm it. People can recognize it. People can see it, but you're the only one that can distinguish it. You see, that's why I can't accept your call, and you can't accept my call. And you know what? I can't explain your call, and I can't comment on it because I wasn't there in the presence of God when you got it. So you've got to lean in the presence of God and allow Him to show you. Don't ask others' opinion of your calling, get into God's presence, because the call of God in our lives is a reflection of Jesus through your gifting, through your personality, and through your abilities. And how you know it's different? Because people will connect with you according to your personality, your gifting, and your talent, and you will be able to unlock and reach people that nobody else can. Look at the person next to you. Say, you are unique. So here's the key. Don't dwell on the qualities and traits that you don't see in yourself. Focus on who you are in Christ. Focus on who you are in Christ. Isaiah was so attuned to God. As a matter of fact, he just made this statement. I'm undone in your presence and I can't speak and I can't do what you called me to do because when he got into God's presence, all he saw was his insecurity and his inability. And then how many know he sent the angels and they touched him with a fiery flame and, and an ember and how many know it set him on fire. So you and I are set on fire, not by our own ability. We set on fire by the grace of Jesus Christ that is working in our lives. And when we capture that in our lives, listen, you become a supernatural being when you're looking at who Jesus is and not who you are yourself. So Isaiah says, send me. Look at the person next to you, say, send me. Can I encourage your faith this morning? God has divine favor for your life this morning. You are God's favorite. If you're born again, you are his blue-eyed baby. (laughs) Blue-eyed. That was the Indian pronunciation and all. (laughs) I was hanging around Robbie too much. (laughs) Blue-eyed baby. You see, God wants us to learn to depend on Him and take full advantage of His grace and His favor in our lives. And you see, when you start to look at Jesus and you see who He is and you see what He is and you see what He can do, you know what? That favor increases. Not not because you have more favor than me, but you're just seeing more of it than I'm seeing. 
How does this happen? The more you move into your calling, the more his favor will increase. How many of you believe God's got something great in store for you this year? How many of you know God is going to increase you this year? You know, the minute you step into that, the more his favor increases. The more you step into it, the more his favor increases. You cannot outstep his favor. Hallelujah. Because he's always two steps ahead of us. The Bible tells us, I have a look quickly at 2 Peter 1 verse 2. May grace, God's favor and peace, which is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity, all freedom from fear, agitating passion and moral conflicts be multiplied to you. Listen how? In the full, personal, precise and correct, what? Knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. The more you get to know him, the more his favor increases. The more you get to know him, the more his grace grows. Just look at the person next to you and say, I have grace. So the more you look at Jesus, the more you focus on his love, the more empowered you become to walk in his grace. If you're a doctor, you're going to find more patience than you can handle. If you're a businessman this morning, people are going to want to do business with you because there's just something about you that they like. And it's not you. It's Christ in you. Amen? You're going you're to find so many clients and so many people to do business with that you're going to have to plan to expand. Hallelujah. When the favor of God continues to shine on our church, guess what? We're going to have to start another service because there are going to be so many people queuing up to come to the service. Why? Because the favor of God is on us. Hallelujah. Amen. We have to push out the walls, lift up the roof, do another floor. Woo! And when people say, wow, what is going on there? You can say, it's the unmerited, unprecedented, unearned favor of the living God that is upon our lives. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Romans 1 verse 17, look at this. It says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Sorry? Called to be saints. Look at the person next to you. Say you're called. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Number two, vision emerges out of our lives. Yo, you're going to love this one. Vision emerges out of our lives through suffering. Oh, so sorry. You know, they say marriage consists of three things. I don't particularly agree with this, but you have the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and then suffering. That's for a lot of marriages, not in this church, of course. (laughs) But listen, another way we could put this is like this. Don't fight for comfort in 2020. Fight for increase. Fight for impact. Fight to make a difference. Because listen, God is not committed to your comfort. He's committed to the call of God on your life. Amen? And if you pursue comfort, all you'll do is backslide. But if you pursue Christ, all he'll do is add to you. Have a look at 1 Peter 5 verse 10. But may the, grace of, may the God of all grace, listen to this, wow, who called us? To his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have, now come on, don't back out on me now, let's read it. After you have, I know some of you are are having withdrawal symptoms, let's say it again. After you have, a while, what will he do? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Who wants to be perfect? Woo! (laughs) All the wives putting up their hands for their husbands. Who wants to be established? Who wants to be strong? Who wants to be settled? Guess what you're going to go through? Now listen, there's biblical suffering and there's unbiblical suffering. I'm not talking about, you know, going through stuff that we shouldn't have to go through. That's just part of life. But you know what? Every time, 
Mandy doesn't treat me right, and that's very seldom. But every time she doesn't treat me right, and I want to go off on her, and I don't. Guess what? I'm suffering in the flesh for the sake of the kingdom, and guess what? God's going to strengthen me. God's going to establish me. God's going to lift me up. Can you say amen? amen? So suffering speaks about... Suffering speaks about going through the process of dying to self so that God can be glorified. And if you're going to be successful in life on any level, there will be some suffering. It's just part of life. We, we could say it another way. I suppose we could say it like this. Suffering translates to self-sacrifice. What, what are you and I going to sacrifice this year so that his name can be glorified, so that we can make progress in his kingdom, because we're not going to do it if we're not willing to sacrifice. Think about this. The world's greatest incredible breakthroughs, benefits, and changes have come, most of them through suffering. The greatest event that this world has ever known was the salvation that Jesus Christ brought at the cross, and guess how it came? through the worst kind of suffering anyone could go through. So I like to remind myself, Larry, if you're enjoying something, it's because someone else sacrificed for you to enjoy it. And if you're sacrificing today, it means you're doing it so someone else later can enjoy it. So it's always worth it. Romans 8 verse 18 says this, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared, listen to this, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you want the glory to be revealed in you? There's going to be some suffering. And you know, the reality is this, all of us have a different kind of suffering to go through if we're going to cap capture and take hold of the vision that God has for our lives. Martin Luther King Jr. suffered and sacrificed so that he's people and nation could be free. Listen to this. On April the 4th, 1968, at six o'clock, he was assassinated. The night before, he stood and preached a sermon, and in the sermon, he made this statement. He said this. Listen carefully. I don't care if I die tomorrow. He said, because I've seen the promised land. He said, I would love to live to be old, but it doesn't matter because I've seen the promised land. He said, I might die tomorrow, but it doesn't matter because my people will be free because I've seen the promised land. He says, we might not enter together, but we will all spend eternity together because Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. Little did he know the next day, he would graduate to heaven. But how many of you know his legacy and his freedom lives on and speaks louder than it ever did while he was alive? What are we willing to sacrifice for our nation, for our people, and for the kingdom of God? Number three, the third thing, vision emerges out of my life through faithfulness. We could say it this way. When I grow and I progress in my life, to the next level. God can birth bigger vision in me. I never dreamt how things would work out in this church eight years ago. Because you know what? I wasn't ready for it. But I had to be faithful with what God had given me to do then, just like all of you, so God could release what he's going to do this year. So it's our faithfulness. Listen to Luke 16, verse 10 to 12. Let me make this statement. I am, when I'm faithful with little, God will entrust increase. So if you're busy with the little, don't be discouraged. Be faithful. If you're busy with little, don't turn away. Be faithful. Luke 16, verse 10 to 12, it says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in what, what is much. And he who is unjust with least is unjust also with much. It builds. Therefore, if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the true riches? What are the true riches? 
God's kingdom, God's people, God's vision for your life. And if he has not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So as we grow in Christ and progress in our daily walk, the deeper and wider our vision becomes. Whatever you're doing this morning, whatever you've been given, whether it's a marriage, a business, a family, children, ministry, service, whatever you've committed to, be faithful, church. It's worth it this morning because when you're faithful with little, God will give you the much. Can you say amen? Amen. Zechariah says, don't despise the day or small things. Jesus spoke clearly in the parable of the talents. Number four. Are you getting some help this morning? Number four. Vision emerges out of our obedience. John 17, 13 verse 17 Amplified says this, If you know these things, blessed and happy are you, and envied if you practice them. Look at the person next to you, say practice. Makes permanent. I wanted to call this point, vision emerges out of our trial, our error, and our failure. But I just thought that would be too negative. Because the reality is, none of us are perfect. And it's not our obedience, it's His obedience in us that qualifies us for God's vision. Can you say amen? You know, it's out of the deep failure in my life, very often, that God's bought the biggest victory. Why? Because in weakness, His grace is perfected. It's when I can't that he can. And so that brings me to the place like Paul said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the grace of Christ may rest upon my life. He wasn't saying I must stay weak. He was saying even when I've been made strong, I still recognize it's only through the grace of Jesus Christ that I can do anything in my life. Look at the person next to you, say it's grace. All right, just quickly, I don't want to run out of time this morning. Hebrews 5 verse 8 and 9 in the Amplified, it says, even although he was a son, speaking about Jesus, look at this, he learned active and special obedience. Listen to this, through the things that he suffered, even Jesus learned obedience. And look what it goes on and says. And his complete experience, making him perfect and equipped. Listen, he became the author of salvation. How did he become the author of his destiny, of his vision, and of our future? Through obedience. But he had to learn that obedience through suffering. He had to learn that obedience through the things he went through. Amen? And you know what? Don't focus on your obedience. Focus on Christ's obedience. He was obedient, so you can be. And you can tap into that, and that will increase the vision and the conviction in your life to move forward. Vision increases when I decrease and I focus myself, sorry, and I focus away from myself, and I put my focus on Jesus. What is it that God is calling you to this morning? What is it that he's depositing in your heart? Listen, you will not see the unlocking and the full revelation of who God wants you to be revealed in you until you come to the place of surrender and obedience. And when you do, it is awesome. Number five, the last one. Vision emerges When I wait on the Lord. Church, this is so important that you you cannot even imagine how important. Think about Jesus. He comes to this earth and the Bible clearly tells us at 12 he already knew what he was called to do. Because you find him in the synagogue preaching the gospel. As a matter of fact, he left his parents to go home. And it took them three days to discover he was gone. I mean, what kind of parents? (laughs) I want to have a chat with Joseph and Mary. I mean, the child's gone three days, and they're like, oh, where's Jesus? It's like, you should have realized after one day. Anyway, but where is Jesus? He's in the temple preaching. He knew at 12. Listen, he waited till he was 30 before God released him into his destiny. And we hear one word from God, and we want to run out there, build a church, change the world. But Jesus took 30 years before he was ready. And he is Jesus. So the reality is this, is whenever I hear from God, whenever I have vision, the bigger the vision, the bigger the decision, the more I need to wait. And I love this because it is so helpful. In Romans 5 verse 3 to 5, it says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces 
Perseverance. What is perseverance? Waiting on the Lord. Patience. And patience produces character. And character produces hope. What is hope? Biblical hope this morning is vision. It's expectation. It only comes after patience, after perseverance has built the character into your life. The Holy Spirit releases the hope, the vision. People often ask, how can I be sure that I'm hearing from God or or am I just making it up? I believe the answer is always wait. The bigger the decision, the more you and I feel in a hurry to have to make a decision. And the more, in hurry you fe- the more in hurry you feel to make the decision, the more determined you need to be to wait on the Lord. Why? Because listen, once you've heard what God has said in your spirit, when you wait, it releases godly wisdom into your life and gives God a chance to show you clearly what it is exactly He wants you to do and how you're going to do it and where you're going to do it. And so it builds the capacity so that you have understanding, so that you know what it is. Waiting strengthens your foundation. Waiting helps you to sense in the spirit what it is God wants you to do, where it is he wants you to do it, and how it is he wants you to go about it. And I know that makes us feel uncomfortable, but when you want to hurry, it's a sure sign you need to wait. Man, I've learned that the hard way. (laughs) Isaiah 40 verse 31 in the Amplified says this. Those who wait on the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in Him, shall change, listen, shall change and renew their strength and power. They will lift up their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint or become tired. This is the year for decrease, for increase. Can you say amen? And so I want to just take a minute, if you would just humor me for a few minutes this morning. I want to remind you of our vision as a local church. We are here to create a home for our partners where we can serve with excellence, remain Bible-based, and we will use every means possible to continue to grow and serve our community with God's love and grace. Our mission statement as a church, Ramah South Coast Family Church extends the kingdom of God by proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are at your service. Look at the person next to you, say, at your service. Now, why is that important? Because it communicates to us what our values are. And what are values? Values are the way... We live our lives and the way we make decisions. Every decision is fashioned through the values that you have. If you have the wrong values, you'll make the wrong decisions. And so what are our values this morning? Our values are service, excellence, Bible-based, growth, and love. In other words, church, listen, everything we do, we don't want to just, you know, it's not not just something, oh, we've got these nice words on on the... on the wall or in our vision. No, no, we want to live by this. What does it mean? It means the next thing we're going to do at the church, we always ask ourselves this question, will it serve others? Will we be able to do it with excellence? Is this biblical, the thing we want to do? Is it going to help people grow and experience more of God? And number five, can we do it with love? You see, that helps us to make decisions. If you'll adopt these values into your life, it will help you make good decisions. And so this year, I want to ask you all a question this morning. What is calling your name? What is calling your name this morning? What vision is gripping you? If you're a partner in this church, The vision of this church should be gripping you. It should be speaking to you. Can you say amen? It should be tugging at your heart and you should be saying, what is my part in this kingdom story? It's not a a thing of forcing anything on anybody because everybody's different. Remember I said your calling is individual and you might feel a prompting to do this but you feel you can't do that. That's fine. Find your place 
and run with it. Can you say amen? Because you will find your purpose in just in. Now, a couple of things we wrote down as our goals, and you'll probably know this, you should all know it. Uh, somewhere around 2018, we said this, we want to reach 500 people every week in attendance. Can you say amen? We said, number two, we want to finish our campus. And number three, we want to pay off our bond. Guess what? Last Sunday, we had 503 people in attendance in the two services. We reached our goal, church. Come on. Give the Lord praise this morning. Woo! Now, we deliberately reached it a few times last year, but we were intentional. I mean, we got a bus. We invited all our friends. We, were, we just wanted to prove to ourselves we can do this. But here we are. God just brings it together. Can you say amen? And listen, church, we're not about counting and, oh, we've got so many. It's not about that. We count people because people count. And it helps us to identify our progress and our growth and our development. Can you say amen? Because now the key comes. We've got to keep those people in the church. Do you know that last week Sunday we had nearly 100 children in our children's church? Just look at the person next to you and say shame. (laughs) Shame on the children's church teachers and all those children in that room. That's why, listen, we have to finish this campus. The children's church is bursting at the seams. We can't grow anymore. We need to finish the the, the offices on that side so we can move them into the bigger children's church. We've got some exciting things. We're going to start an anatomy program, which is going to make it easier for children to be registered. If you're a member of our church, you'll have a little tag. You just scan it on the computer. Your children will be registered like that. We've got a lot of upgrades we want to do. Why? Because we want to keep building the house of God. Can you say amen? This is not our church. It's your church. And we are building it together. Can you say amen? So you can say, well, what can I do? Well, number one, make a commitment to bring your treasure. Make a commitment that you're going to tithe this year. You're going to bring your offering this year. You're going to be dedicated to that. Why? Because every cent you give is used to extend the vision that God's given us. Don't worry, that's just my mom reminding me it's lunchtime. You can bring your time and your talent. You can bring... Your time and your talent. You can volunteer your time. Some of you are the most gifted people in areas, and God wants to use your gift to glorify Him. Maybe you can play an instrument. Maybe you're good with children. Maybe you're good with youth. Find where you can get involved and do it. And none of these things are to make anyone feel bad, but it's definitely to challenge all of you that you have something that you can bring. That can make a difference. Now, I understand people at different levels so, and, and different forms of growth and different pressures on our lives. So find out what it is and get involved. You can do that if you want to volunteer your time and your talent. Come this Thursday night, 7 o'clock. We are doing a volunteer training and information night. And you are very welcome to come and find out where you can get involved. And we want every key leader, every leader, please make sure you're here with your volunteer team. Because this will be the one and only volunteer training meeting we have this year because this is what the Lord's told us to do and we'll be starting immediately is we're going to be having every six weeks we're going to have a Wednesday night harvest night here at the church on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock and we're going to intentionally use it to invite the lost, invite the unsaved, invite your family and friends. All our small groups will close, all the sore discipleship will close, everybody will be on a Wednesday night, volunteers, leaders, everyone. We're going to worship this roof off and then we're going to throw out our nets and we're going to reach the lost. Can you say amen? And it'll be a time of refreshing and a time of healing and a time of recovery and we're starting the first one, please write this down, the 8th of April. It's the Wednesday before Easter, and listen to this, guess what? Pastor Ray Bevan from Wales will be here as our guest speaker. Can you say amen? So that'll be our first harvest night, and he'll be here the whole weekend, the whole Easter weekend. He'll be doing the service for us. It's really going to be incredible. So start thinking about who are you inviting. Look at the person next to you. Say, who's your one? Who's your one? Who are you bringing that night? Who are you bringing to church? Because there's someone God's going to put on your heart. All right, and then in closing, I did say that earlier, hey, but now I'm really, I'm like a good pilot. I'm just circling the runway, just checking out, can I come into land? You see, and I'm going to come into land now, 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 now. What are the areas we need help in right now? Let me just give you a few, and I'm going to put the faces of our leaders up, and you can go speak to them as the Lord tugs in your heart. Number one, our youth ministry. 
Our youth ministry is growing and flourishing right now, but we need to, before the end of this year, we've got to break it up into two groups because we've got the younger age, but we're not getting the older age. So we need someone to help Richard and his team lead there. So we need help in the youth ministry. We, we desperately need help in the children's church. Big church and faith kids. We need people to help us because it is exploding. And as soon as the building's done, we're going to start another age group out of the faith kids age group so that we can have the right ages together. So we definitely need help in that arena. Small groups. Man, we need venues and leaders for our small groups. So you can get involved as a small group leader or a small group venue, and we'll put a leader there in that venue to help you to grow. We need worshipers. People who feel called into the worship ministry, playing an instrument, singing. Uh, We need help in the sound desk and in the camera. Do you know that right now we have an opportunity, which we haven't taken and can't take right now, but we want to take it to go onto TV. I've been given a 30-minute slot on Swane TV and Gao TV. All I've got to do is we've got to be at a place where our production and our quality is at the standard where they can use it. So, We need help there in that area, and we're busy upgrading some computers so we can get ready to do that. Then we need help in the coffee bar in the area of hospitality and serving. We need help as stewards. You can come and steward. How do I do that? Prepare yourself. Go on the Saw Discipleship course. Let us train you. Start getting involved. Put your hands to something, and we'll develop you. We're not the best, but we growing. We're doing better and we want to get better. So there are lots of areas you can get involved. Look at the person next to you and say, can you feel the calling? Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today, the first step into knowing your calling is stepping in to salvation. So if you're here today, you've never been born again, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you might know about him. You might have even gone to church, but you've never personally accepted Jesus. This is your moment And I promise you, God is calling you by name right now. Maybe you once served God, but you're backstead and you're out of fellowship. You want to come back this morning. Or maybe you're sitting there today and you want more. You're hungry for more. And you say, man, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. Would you pray for me today? If you're in any one of those categories, on the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Raise your hand wherever you are. This is your moment. God bless you, sir. Is there someone else this morning? God is calling you into fellowship. God is calling you to salvation. God is calling you to rededicate your life this morning or be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is your moment. Is there someone else this morning who'd like to join that gentleman just quickly? If you raise your hand, sir, just quickly stand right where you are. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. We want you to just step to the back of the building and go meet our leaders there. We're going to pray for you and with you. Is there someone else? I feel a tugging. There's somebody else this morning. Who are you? Just respond. Raise your hand. You want to be saved. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to rededicate your life. Just stand where you are and just quietly move to the back of the building. We'll pray with you. So I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me and I'm going to ask the whole congregation to pray out loud. Say, Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, that he died at Calvary for my sin, that you raised him from the dead so that I could be saved. Thank you for saving me today. I receive your Holy Spirit and I ask you to fill me with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can go with our leaders. We'll let you back in the service in a moment. Let's give the Lord a great praise offering this morning.